speaker. Ms. Joan Rolfing became president and chief operating officer of the Nuclear Threat Initiative in 2010. By providing leadership to all NDI programs, she also co directs the Secretariat for the Nuclear Security Project led by former Secretary of State George Schultz, former Secretary of Defense William Perry, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, and former Se Senator Sam Moon in their effort to galvanize global action to reduce urgent nuclear dangers and build support for reducing reliance on nuclear weapons, ultimately ending another threat to the world. Over the last 10 years, Ms. Rolfing has played a critical role in guiding the organization. She was part of the original team that created the mission and scope for the Nuclear Threat Initiative in 2000. Once the organization was launched in 2001, she has played strategic roles in key programs including the design and launch of several of NTI SOLMA projects such as the World Institute for Nuclear Security, the Middle East Consortium on Inspections of Deep Surveillance and the Nuclear Security Project. She was appointed to the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board Task Force on Nuclear Non-Proliferation in 2014. She is a member of the Directorate Advisory Committee of National Security Directorate at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. For 2012 and 2016 International Nuclear Security Summits, Ms. Rolfing served as an advisor to the Companion Nuclear Industry Summit. <coughs> Ms. Rolfing holds a master's degree from the University of Maryland and a bachelor's degree from the University of Illinois. The discussion for the day is Ambassador Dr. Shri Kal Sharma. Dr. Sharma holds a degree of PhD in higher energy physics from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, and belongs to the 1973 batch of India's diplomatic service IFS. In the initial nine years from 1973 to 1981, Dr. Sherma served in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and in the Ministry of External Affairs in the division dealing with the Middle East. From 1981 to 2008, he continued to study, work or represent India in the broad field of nuclear non-proliferation, disarmament and security affairs. As a fellow in IDSA, New Delhi as first secretary in India's permanent mission to UN in Geneva, as a director in the Ministry of External Affairs, as a senior diplomat, with the International Atomic Energy Agency from 1994 to 2000 as Joint Secretary and Head of the Division of Disarmament and International Security in MEA. He served as Ambassador of India to Vienna and permanent representative to UN offices there, including the International Atomic Energy Agency. As India's Ambassador to Vienna, Dr. Sharma was also India's governor on the IAEA board from 2004 to 2008. In between, he has also served in Algeria and during 1991 to 1940 edited the division in MEA dealing with Southeast Asia and Pacific being the senior point person for India's Blue East policy in MEA. He was appointed the Secretary General of SAR by 29th session of SAR Council of Ministers and has been in office since March 2008. I would now request Ms. Sloan Rolfing to begin. Thank you. very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. This is my first visit to CLAWS and I'm excited to have an audience, uh, a broad ranging audience. I understand that nuclear security is a new issue for many of our attendees today. So I'm going to start um, with uh, some basic framing information to help explain uh, the problem. And Maybe just a, a little bit more about myself and the Nuclear Threat Initiative, how I got into this and uh, why we are so seized of this issue. I spent about 15 years in government before coming to the Nuclear Threat Initiative in 2001. And uh, during my period in government, primarily focused on nuclear security issues, uh, by which I mean the full breadth of nuclear security. I, worked at the Defense Department on nuclear policy. I worked on Capitol Hill as a professional staff member for the House Armed Services Committee where I did acquisition of major military systems and oversight of those systems. And 
then I went to the energy department where I was responsible for advising three consecutive energy secretaries on nuclear issues, everything ranging from the stockpile of US nuclear weapons and how we were managing it to non-proliferation and arms control. And so I like to say I've seen all aspects of this problem from the inside. I had the opportunity in 2001 to help set up a new organization outside of the government and uh, to work with some uh, other former government officials in doing that. I was invited by former Deputy Energy Secretary Charles Curtis and uh, former uh, Senator Sam Nunn, who was the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And they both brought a passion uh, about reducing the nuclear threat to uh, this new institution. And we began exploring ways of private organizations could partner with governments on, on nuclear threat reduction. One of the issues that we, uh, as we set out and developed our initial business plan at NTI, we identified preventing nuclear terrorism as an absolute priority, as a core issue that we wanted the Nuclear Threat Initiative to work on. And this was in January of 2001 that we stood up this organization, so before our 9 11 attacks, where at that time in the US, the appreciation or understanding of terrorism was quite low. Not at all like here in uh, India, where uh, you've had uh, the unfortunate experience of uh, uh, more terrorist incidents, and so there's a much more kind of palpable understanding of the nature of the threat. And so we were, um, to a large degree, our first nine months of existence, we were voices in the wilderness talking about the risk of nuclear terrorism. Then 9-11 happened, and um, it was a very unfortunate event. But this issue suddenly seized the attention of our political leadership. And there was a renewed, or I would say, a real first time focus on the need to prevent nuclear terrorism. So how do we do that? And, and how real is the threat? I'm going to talk, I'm just going to kind of walk through four main topics today. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the threat, a little bit about what we've been doing at NTI and how we've been working with the partners to reduce the risk of nuclear terrorism, a little bit about the role of the nuclear security summits, and then finally I'm going to focus in on a particular challenge, and that is how do we strengthen the security of military materials? So with respect to the threats, um, you already heard General Nagel mention that there is a lot of uh, weapons usable materials scattered around the world. There is um, approximately 2,000 metric tons of highly enriched uranium and you know, plutonium in its separated form. And these are the two primary design materials that form the core of a nuclear weapon. And these are very difficult materials to make. Um, neither of these occur in this form in nature. Plutonium is a man <coughs> Um, highly enriched uranium is arrived at through a process of enriching natural uranium that uh, takes special equipment, major uh, investment. Um, these materials are uh, difficult to achieve unless you are a government that has substantial resources required to build uh, reprocessing uh, capabilities, enrichment capabilities, uh, reactors. Um, so in the beginning of the nuclear age, um, the concern about nuclear terrorism was much less because the capacity to make these materials and then fabricate them into a weapon will be um, uh, capabilities that only an advanced nuclear power could achieve. So what's changed? What's changed is um, a couple of things. First of all, it's both the material and the know-how and the technologies to make these materials are now much more widely distributed around the world. There are today um, 25 countries 
that have at least one kilogram or more of highly rich uranium or plutonium. And I would say that at least a dozen of those countries have much, much more than just one kilogram. The US and Russia have the largest stockpiles of those materials. And the concern is that if terrorists kind of skip the hard step, they skip over um, actually fabricating these materials themselves by stealing this material, illicitly acquiring it on the black market or through an insider um, who's working at a facility where these materials exist, that they would then have um, really the capability. It's, it's uh, not difficult to see, given that there's a lot of information on the web about how you fabricate uh, a weapon, given that you can, as we've seen, with our purchase, um, the expertise required to make a nuclear weapon. So the, the big step is acquiring the material. And terrorists have stated that they are interested in acquiring these materials. Al Qaeda uh, has had a systematic effort to acquire a uh, nuclear weapon for more than a dozen years. Uh, ISIS, uh, for those of you following the news, have seen that ISIS in uh, July of last year obtained about 40 kilograms of uranium not enriched uranium it's fortunately but uranium materials from Mosul University after it over overtook Mosul and ISIS has clearly demonstrated its interest in acquiring a nuclear capability and these materials could be used to create if not a mushroom cloud then a so-called dirty bomb a radiological weapon which would disperse material uh, over a large area. And then just to come to the uh, punchline, not only are, uh, do we not have strong security at every facility, or strong enough security at every facility that has these materials, there's no international rules of the road for how these materials should be secured. It's uh, pretty much each country uh, determines its own and within uh, some broad guidelines published by the International Atomic Energy Agency, but we don't yet have an international system, which is, I think, a dangerous place to be. And needless to say, all it takes is one week to, to endanger all of us. Um, I rely upon your capacity to secure your materials, you rely upon my capacity to secure my materials, and so we're, we're kind of joined together in this. Um, this is just a graphic. The, the background here is uh, from a document that was found in a safe house in Pakistan. Uh, an Al Qaeda safe house. These three figures below <coughs> some Al Qaeda leadership. Um, the two gentlemen on the left have uh, disappeared. These all three are at large. Uh, in the center of the Al Qaeda effort to acquire nuclear weapons. There's been some recent speculation by a former U.S. intelligence officer that the two gentlemen on the left um, dropped off of the Al-Qaeda organization chart, perhaps because they wanted to be proper to continue working on the weapons program. So what's the problem today? In the absence of an effective global system, what does that mean? It means we have a culture of accountability to each other, no common standards, no shared set of best practices for how materials should be secured. No way to measure progress or assess each other's performance. And this is a domain that's unlike other shared risk domains. So running off an example, we have a shared risk domain when it comes to international civil aviation. Uh, because we have planes crossing borders all of the time and we want to make sure that our passengers can fly safely, there is an international civil aviation organization that sets standards that are strictly enforced by that organization. And if an airline doesn't meet the standards set by the ICAO, uh, it's not permitted to fly. There won't be given landing rights in uh, states that belong to ICAO. Yet with the most dangerous materials on Earth, it's kind of each country for itself, more or less. And I think that has to change over time. It's not a sustainable position. In fact, it's a very dangerous one. <laughs> so I'll say now just a word about um, a process called the Global Dialogue, 
as NTI kind of looked at this problem of no international standards and, and no platform for talking about uh, international standards internationally, we thought, well, why don't we convene a group of representatives from states as well as some external experts and begin having a conversation about what should those standards look like? What are the, the key things that all governments should do and should agree to do in order to strengthen nuclear material security? And so before the um, before the, the 2014 nuclear security summit, we had this process of meetings over about an 18 month period in these various locations, uh, brought together um, many of the Sherpas who participate. Uh, Sherpas is the, the name given to the senior government official who's uh, supporting their government in the nuclear security summit process. And we brought together a core group of Sherpas to have this discussion. Um, you can see on the right the number of governments that participated in this uh, dialogue process. Um, also outside experts from the main countries on the left, we have representatives of nuclear industry, also the International Atomic Energy Agency, the World Institute of Nuclear Security. And we had, I would say, a very interesting dialogue about what should this system look like. And the punchline after about 18 months are these four bullets are the, the framing objectives that this international group came up with. The group agreed that, first of all, we need a system and the system should be comprehensive, by which uh, they meant all weapons, useful materials, and facilities should be covered by such a system. Not just the civil part of the problem, but including military materials, because they comprise a large portion of the materials of concern. That all states that have these materials should agree to adhere to international standards and best practices, and then it's not good enough for states to say, trust me, our materials are secure, but we need to come up with some way to demonstrate the confidence-building measures and reassuring actions that um, our materials really are secure. That we need a system that's more than just uh, rhetoric, but actually has a, a demonstration component to it. And finally, that over time, states need to consistently work to minimize risks by eliminating materials where possible and reducing their stocks. Um, we may not be able to, especially as we maintain nuclear energy programs, eliminate all stocks. But in some cases, we have large stockpiles of separated material that are far in excess of the needs of the civil programs. And those numbers can be brought down. Less material in fewer facilities is the less risk we have. So what role has the nuclear summit process played in strengthening material security? Um, I would say a huge and significant role. The fact that heads of state came together around this issue um, now three times, in 2010, 2012, and 2014, and there's a fourth meeting plan for 2016, which will be in the US somewhere. Um, means that heads of state have had to focus on this issue. There are more than 50 heads of state who have attended the summit discussions. Um, it's created some sense of accountability among them. Uh, it's strengthened actions. Each state has come to, this, come to these meetings uh, with deliverables, and that is they've made commitments with respect to their material security, national commitments. And a number of countries, and you can see in the last poll, and a dozen of them over this series of summits have completely eliminated their highly enriched uranium. And so the number of states, uh, just in the last few years, I would say since the time uh, NTI started its work in 2001, we've gone from approximately 42 states with fissile materials to 25 today. So that's progress. I'm not going to read this whole chart the purpose of this chart is just to show you the most recent summit in The Hague. These are excerpts from the communique that the heads of state agreed on. And you can see 
some of the things that uh, work for me are actually well aligned with the four principles on the nuclear material security system that the Sherpas discussed through the global dialogue process. It turns out that um, these ideas that they generated in a semi-official form, they uh, were able to import into the official forum. And so they've embraced the need for an international architecture, one that's comprehensive. They've embraced the need for um, providing assurances, some kind of confidence building in the effectiveness of their regimes. They've uh, agreed on the need to minimize stocks, and they've agreed broadly to implementing IAEA nuclear security principles and guidelines, which is really critical because that forms the basis of the standards and best practices that have so far been missing. So where are we uh, in the security summit process? That process is expected to end next year, the Washington or Chicago sure whether it's going to be a Washington summit or a Chicago summit. The U.S. summit um, is widely anticipated to be the final summit, and so one of the challenges that Sherman's are now discussing is how do we sustain this high level of attention and the progress that we've made beyond 2016? Uh, how can we address unfinished business? And there's a couple of um, big issues of un unfinished business. One is military materials, providing strength and security for military materials, and the other is the utter management of plutonium. So let me just <coughs> end by spending a few minutes talking about military materials in particular. The reason it's so essential that military materials be subject to some kind of standards and practices is that they comprise 83% of the materials of concern. Um, that 2,000 metric tons of materials globally that I talked about in the beginning, 83% of that is in the military uh, sector. The other 17% uh, is in the civil sector. And so if we only focus on the civil sector, we won't get the job done. We can't be assured that uh, the material subject to nuclear terrorism Say. Uh, the Hague Summit reaffirmed the need for all materials at all times to be secured. Uh, this was a paragraph that was greatly debated and specifically debated in the context of military materials. That was what was meant by um, uh, all materials. And, uh, and the issue here is that existing mechanisms for nuclear material security there is a treaty, the Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials, that applies only to civilian materials at 17%. There are IAEA uh, guidelines that applies only to 17%. So how do we get at, how do we get at, you see the orange slice, that's the 17%. How do we get at the rest of the problem? And this presents a particular challenge because there is a, strongly held assumption that if the materials are under military control, they must be very highly secure, and therefore we don't need to worry about them. And unfortunately, uh, our real-world experience would demonstrate otherwise. So I can come back to this chart later if uh, folks want, but let me talk just a little bit about the types of materials uh, Active warheads are a small percentage of that. Retired warheads, a small percentage. There is, uh, uh, let me just go back to this for a minute so you can see um, a set aside in those countries that use highly rich uranium for naval fuel. That's the 16%. Um, there's a small wedge that the US and Russia have declared military material that is access to the military needs, and they're committed to put it under safeguards and uh, in some cases to disposition that material. And then there's this big block of 37%, which, by the way, these figures are all based on uh, public information, public sources. Um, we believe they are reasonable approximations. Uh, our government colleagues have not disputed the, the basic uh, message here. Uh, the 
37% need some work to unpack it further. Many of these forms are not classified, especially in that 37% block. We um, believe confidence building uh, is feasible around some of this material. So let's get at some of the myths and some of the facts. <laughs> Again, the myths that military material are under military protection. Not true. Not all of the military material is under military protection. In the United States, the vast bulk of this material is at Department of Energy facilities protected by the civilian guard force. Um, many assume that security is stronger around those materials. Uh, and um, as we have seen from a series of recent incidents, there was a major security incident to breach of um, the US Y-12 facility. Uh, that is the facility which is kind of our uh, major vault for highly enriched uranium. It's the single largest storage facility in the U.S. And the exterior perimeter was uh, penetrated by uh, three demonstrators, including an 82-year-old mom. Uh, they were on site for 45 minutes before they were apprehended by the authorities. It was uh, in the report, the special report, you see the image up here that was uh, right up how did this happen? Bottom line, a lot of failures, multiple point failures, which is true of almost any accident or incident. It's not just a single point failure. It's three or four or five systems failing at the same time. The U.S. had another incident in uh, 2007, which was really, I think, quite astonishing, where an aircraft was loaded with six nuclear weapons at Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota and flown clear across the country to Barksdale in Louisiana and landed it. And the weapons were left to sit on the runway unguarded because they did not realize they had nuclear weapons on board. Mistakenly, uh, they, they were supposed to have loaded some dummy weapons some inert weapons for a training mission and carry them to Marksdale. Somehow, they loaded my nuclear weapons, not knowing that they were carrying them and flew them across the country. Now, the uh, uh, former commander of our Strategic Forces Command, before this incident, said, an incident like this could never happen, could never, ever happen. And then it did. We had to confess, well, now it's happened. We need to look at our procedures and where we fail. Such incidents aren't limited to the U.S. I'm highlighting the U.S. Unfortunately, there are many such incidents. And there have been many more in the U.S. I could do a whole briefing just on the series of U.S. incidents in the last two years, um, where we had to relieve uh, senior military officers in charge of nuclear command and control, as well as more junior officers in the field commanding our so this is a this is a real issue. It's a live issue. Uh, breaking, a serious breaking at the Palandala facility in South Africa. Uh, guards falling asleep at uh, facilities in the UK. It's endemic. Uh, let me come to the last myth and theft slide. There is a myth that in the military sector, all material is in sensible forms, highly classified. Therefore. You know, we could never do any kind of um, security measures or confidence building measures. Uh, they're all at highly sensitive sites or inaccessible locations, and that classified information would be compromised if we try to do any kind of collaborative uh, nuclear security around military materials. The fact, however, is that much of this material is not in a sensitive form. Much of it is at facilities, some of these facilities are quite sensitive, but not all aspects of the, of the facilities are sensitive. And the U.S. and Russia have certainly demonstrated through many years of cooperation that they have found ways to cooperate on some of the most sensitive materials at some of their most sensitive facilities without problem classified information, and I won't go through all of these either, but this is just a list of some of the cooperative programs we've had with Russia, where 
we have um, shared access to facilities for you to take measurements about materials coming out of one place and coming into another, um, where we've actually done verifications on the confidence that we have. And what this demonstrates is a proof of concept that um, there are, in fact, very creative ways to cooperate on material security without compromising sensitive information. And finally, I'll just mention one of our current projects. Um, at the request of a group of Sherpas who are participating in the next round of the nuclear security summit, NTI has been asked to develop a set of recommendations working with international experts on how military material security can be strengthened and what international confidence building measures might be applied to military materials. So we're in the process of uh, this discussion with a range of experts uh, coming out of the military community. This is largely a group of people who have responsibility for these facilities or command and control of weapons. And uh, they're tackling this issue. We expect the report to come out in the summer time frame. And uh, we will then feed it back into, and this is a list of some of the numbers. This is still an evolving list. Uh, we will feed the results of the study uh, back into the summer process for deliberation by the surplus. So let me, uh, let me end with, on that note, I mean, I Back, uh, they were different. 
two cards and came from together and they will say, what for the required is not this. Like it's required is that for Pakistan can get, it get to Pakistan proliferation and what can happen in China and Pakistan. That is more important for us than anything else. So this is where the, the focus of tension and the preoccupations were different. But after the test and after the uh, first four years of Indo-US dialogue, uh, my two problems one, uh, India went came online, and since 2000, and now it's become 15 years, uh, Indian government also has taken a number of steps. Some they have applied, some they have not. And uh, like they, they, they signed and ratified the Critical Protection Convention in 2000, which we were telling them in 1994 onwards from the IHA, but they had preservation, but 2000 we did this. And uh, 2002 it was notified. Then they joined very actively for the 2005 convention or an amendment to the convention, and that was also signed in 95. They signed all international uh, agreements which were concerned with terrorism, and uh, India coordinated with the IAEA on uh, security issues. Uh, uh, it was in the forefront supporting IAEA program and activities in this area. And uh, then, when I was ambassador in the IAEA, we used to push our non line country. Uh, colleagues to say, look, nuclear security is separate. And you say, we should realize the problem. And what Joan said, every word of what she says is true. It, I'm telling you it without exaggeration. These are the real fears that we have. Somehow or the other, these fears are not realized. Or if they are realized, they are clouded by the shadow of the other bigger issues or other bigger political issues. So people are not willing to focus on it. And that's where the need for uh, sensitizing and bringing the uh, uh, people to start to focus on this. So in that respect, I must say, you know, what NTI has done is, uh, is extraordinary in, in the past uh, several years. You, you have really brought world attention to this, uh, you know, captured imagination. And uh, the nuclear security summit, the nuclear security summit process is indicative of the seriousness of things that when no one was paying attention, President Obama decided that he would have to reach out to the heads of states and governments to focus on this. So uh, an issue is so important that it required head of state attention and uh, a participation by the heads of government to zero in on the importance of this issue. And if you see the evolution of the NSS as you uh, has captured, uh, it shows how focus has now come to some of the duels which are possible and which are required. So I think uh, this is the kind of a uh, situation where we are. And uh, uh, my, uh, my purpose in uh, focusing this uh, from India perspective is that, uh, you know, uh, what is happening in India is that this issue requires intense attention and also a very careful, calibrated, guarded uh, transparency, media uh, exposure. However, the focus uh, on the nuclear material in the weapons uh, field is something like there's a magic drop not talk about it because it's disconnected, intimately insecure. So, and when the expression building on, up on that front, then they, they climb up, then they say, well, it, it's something uh, not very, uh, you know, very good. So that's where one uh, thing has to be worked out with my confidence. The NTI, in spite of all this focus, what happens in the media is that these two NTI reports and indexes, they have shown India in bad light, in company of uh, what uh, our people don't say this nowadays, but everyone intimately realizes the wrong states in the world. And India doesn't consider itself a wrong state. So when India finds itself in the company of the wrong states, it puts people off. So we've had a lot of time, time to stay, I mean, those who like to still focus on the question have had a hard time trying to tell them those who are upset that, well, you know, this is one aspect, but don't be covered by that, see the larger picture. 
However, the latter picture does have an effect because uh, this whole process of trying to work together involves our great neighbor Pakistan. And it is given the same kind of credits despite its, uh, its, uh, you know, its shenanigans and its blunders as others. So that is a big problem with uh, Indian uh, you know, academics and uh, government policy makers face. That if you treat Pakistan as equal to everyone else, in the face of consistent violation of things, like even today they have not ratified the principles of 2005 amendment to the Indian government. That amendment actually focuses on sabotage and and talks of a number of things that are connected with indirect terrorism. They have not done anything with the uh, nuclear suppression, uh, suppression of nuclear terrorism convention. And any enabling stuff for that is only make believe. They might make announcements uh, and they might say things that we are doing this, but there is no way of uh, you know, verifying that because India deals with them on territorial issues, finds that uh, in the tracking of actual terrorists, they do nothing. And there will be nine judges from 2009 to 2015 to track and to try the Bombay attack perpetrators. One of them was bumped off. Nothing happened about who killed them. So all that confidence shattering experience with Pakistan puts us in a very difficult position when we talk about transparency in this thing. Transparency in the company of a group where Pakistan is equally represented. Same way when you give China a certain uh, uh, status there, uh, there is a certain separation because what Chinese say and what they do, even American literature is full of it that even their budgetary figures are not what they are, they are what they spend on military defense. A military budget is very different. So to believe that what Chinese say are correct or so these are some of the questions which dog. Uh, so in that context, uh, the uh, the extraordinary focus of NTI on, on some of these things get uh, you know gets clouded, and uh, that's where uh, this, this presentation is very useful because it it brings back the aspects where uh, you know where one should focus and not uh, be driven by the other things. The fact is that the larger questions we cannot solve. The terrorism question is a much larger issue. And for that, whatever international efforts are going on, there is uh, still a, a gap between what is achievable and what is desirable. And this whole in the last 10 years of Afghanistan and Iraq and ISIS, it shows where, where the real problem is. But uh, this reduction and reduction of certain, like since you cannot deal with terrorism and still focus on this, is not the logic which should work. I feel we should separate the two and try and see what can be done. Uh, there is this uh, uh, process of uh, the nuclear security summit which we don't reflect it uh, very uh, succinctly. Where now they are thinking what to do with it. And I came across this very interesting idea of Cambridge uh, and others who talk about working out some kind of framework and mentioned internationally. On the on the uh, convention of climate change, where the nation states correctly agree to a certain uh, you know benchmarks to be uh, to be achieved by a certain level, but by a certain time, and uh, accept certain standards. So maybe that that could be one of the areas which, in my mind, uh, uh, you know attracts attention uh, because these international standards for nuclear security. <coughs> Needs to be, they need to be adopted and they need to be adopted with some confidence. So there is uh, there is a bit of a rupture uh, in logic because when you see things from the international focus, it seems to be uh, logical, and but when you see it uh, from internal focus you know, from, the, from the point of view of the domestic situation of a country, then all kinds of questions come up. And transparency is one of the things which uh, is. Uh, in a very wide view. There is uh, the idea that general issues in security could be put uh, in the uh, greater transparency. However, the operational issues which actually make uh, impinge on the security of uh, the country's concern will require 
much more care and calibration uh, to be uh, brought up in public. So some of these ideas are there, and uh, anti-AI uh, process continues. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. We have uh, a lot of people there ask questions, but I just wanted to put some of these uh, uh, points to your attention. Uh, in general, in support of uh, what uh, John has said, but at the same time, giving you a window to where the problems are in India. So I think uh, yeah. uh, the door is open for questions. Uh, if, the, if, if 
institution that suffers from all of the kind of bureaucratic inertia of any large bureaucratic institution. And so may be difficult to get the kind of innovations um, that we need out of the IAP, but it will clearly have to play a central role. And then we'll need to look at other mechanisms. There's some creative thinking going on within the community. I suspect that um, the Convention on Physical Protection of Material Materials may become um, uh, an umbrella for uh, some organizing activities. Uh, but we're going to have to wait and see, and the good news is, because of the positive results that have come out of the summit process, I believe there will be some follow-on process that's established. Um, you asked about the state complicity in acts of terror as not being so much a focus of the rest of the world. I would agree with you, I think, where you stand. That depends on where you sit and what part of the world you want to be living. Make a difference uh, with that. We are, unfortunately, um, I would say this whole question of how does one establish some norms for state behavior and establish accountability mechanisms for state behavior, it's got to be through a disarmament process. Eventually, it's, it must be in uh, some form of uh, negotiated arms control. And we're pretty far away from any serious multilateral discussion on arms control. It lags um, you know, quite a ways behind the nuclear material security. Hopefully that will change over time, and hopefully it will happen before a crisis. Um, as with everything in life, usually crises precipitate uh, political momentum for change. So let's hope we're smart enough to get in front of that. Uh, Russian withdrawal from uh, cooperation on nuclear security is a significant challenge. Um, they have indicated uh, that they are not, they have not yet participated in the Sherpa meetings that have occurred in the planning for the 2016 summit. Hope springs eternal, they may decide to join one of the late meetings and come to the summit. Uh, but I would say, even if they don't, there is still a very rich and valuable dialogue that's occurring with the rest of the world. And it's a pity if the Russians aren't there, I mean, they will lose some leverage in helping to shape the consensus development that's happening. And uh, I personally think that that's to their detriment, not to their benefit, but they're clearly trying to send a signal to the rest of the world um, on a lot of different things. It's a whole separate uh, discussion. We, we hope that things change, but I think there's room for good work even in their absence. And could not agree more with your final point about nuclear security being a journey, not a destination. You're absolutely right. Um, this is one critical point that our community needs to keep hammering home. I think many of our political leaders still believe that it's a destination, and with a few more years of hard work, we will reach it, and then we can, we're done, we're finished. Um, but with any hard global challenge, we have to keep up. It's always evolving. The nature of the challenge is always increasing. The amount of material we have, the number of sites we have, none of that is static. And practices and technologies are changing. So we need a dynamic system with really smart people who are invested in it and with leaders who continue to take personal responsibility for the security of the materials within their states on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this very nice presentation. I know NPI is doing a very good job as well as the sanitizing of security and the sensor. But I would like to talk on two issues. First, the civilian and the second is the military part. In the civilian part, we find that the physical material banks have come out, whereby the physical materials can be taken. So the two aspects are one is the physical material and the second is the spent fuel. So we need to have more nuanced approach towards these two things. Especially for the spent few. We find even in Japan and other, they are finding it difficult to uh, process the spent few. So if some international agreement would be made whereby the spent few could process in a proper way, that would help greatly in uh, controlling the security. The second part is the military. Now the, as far as military material is concerned, to get a cooperation from nations is very different. 
if you see there has been change, new uh, actors have come up. It is not the P5, they are new actors. So if the multilateral meetings take place, taking into account all the new players who have come, I don't think any substantial progress can take place as far as the military material security is concerned. So I feel that disarmament is a process, but uh, multilateral treaties, especially inviting the new players and overhauling the nuclear environment is required. So that the new players also become more responsible. So is NTI thinking on those uh, points? Yes. <laughs> uh, I'll start with your last question. I completely agree. I think we are, as an expression in the US, whistling past the graveyard, pretending like we're never going to die, right? Um, with respect to the P5, putting on your blinders and continuing to behave as if the discussions amongst just the five can somehow solve this larger global problem. Um, I have personally been advocating for an expanded dialogue for years. And um, in a way, the NPT has trapped us into this obsolete process of dialogue. And I think it's vital that we find a way to have a more inclusive dialogue. Otherwise, we're simply being completely unrealistic about the nature of the problem. On the fissile, the spent fuel issue, uh, yeah, spent fuel poses an absolutely huge management problem. There's lots of it. It's growing around the world as um, our civilian energy programs are growing, and we have no repositories for um, the high-level waste or for storage of spent fuel long-term. Um, I think our governments have, uh, while they understand they have a problem, they have not yet develop the political will they need to solve that in a creative fashion. And spent fuel, some would argue, poses less of a challenge because it's so highly radioactive that a terrorist would die trying to um, process the material, the plutonium held in spent fuel form. But um, I, well, security can be left there. And, and we have some real concerns at NTI that some of the material that has cooled for a period of decades is that radiation barrier is uh, much less present and I think that poses a significant challenge. So the further we get into the nuclear age, the more of a uh, problem this becomes for us and you're right to raise that as an issue. Thank you. Um, I Uh, you know, uh, issues of uh, 
retaining or for uh, going for nuclear uh, option. But then again, this this uh, does exacerbates the nuclear risk at the same time. You know, completely. You know, uh, as you just mentioned, uh, that you know, this is possible that you can't have that kind of attitude. So, I mean, how do we resolve this kind of contradiction? Nuclear sovereignty on one side, quite justifiably for some states, and then again, meeting the nuclear risk. Thank you. So that is a great philosophical question, and that is, I think, one of the no, 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 but I welcome that question because I think it's precisely the kind of question that I wish our political leaders were willing to discuss. If you put your finger on the, the key challenge, the key hurdle that prevents us from developing a much more rational um, and sustainable system for managing our nuclear enterprises. And when I say managing our nuclear enterprises, I'm primarily talking about how can we maintain the benefits of the atom for the progress of the human race, for nuclear power generation, for medicine, without managing to destroy ourselves in the process. And I think we need to think differently about sovereignty. I think in a globalized world where we are all fundamentally dependent on each other for creating a sustainable uh, future, from a security standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, we're going to need to think about sovereignty in a new way. Um, does every state have the sovereign right to obliterate humanity? I would say no. Does every state have the right to obliterate its people or a region? I would say no. That, in fact, is um, the, the, the role of a state is quite the opposite. It's to preserve and sustain its societies uh, and its citizens. And in this nuclear age where we have, uh, where, where such great power can be concentrated in the hands of a few people, states are going to need to think about giving up some of the rights that they previously, previously said were you know, sovereign rights. I think they're at odds with the kind of um, governments and security structures we need international level. Now, um, I'm not talking about just denying some states the ability to uh, maintain certain weapons. I, I think that type of a system has clearly failed. Uh, a system where some states are allowed to have technologies or capabilities and other ones, that's not sustainable. Everyone has to be subject to the same set of rules and has to be willing to observe the same set of uh, both constraints and uh, responsibilities and, and benefits. Um, so I, you know, I think we need to work seriously on disarmament, and that is a concept that people pay lip service to, but not very many people have actually thought about what are the specific steps that it takes, takes to get there. Some people say, oh yeah, that's just as long a distance goal, we're never going to achieve it. I believe that it is an achievable end state. I don't believe that we can put the genie back in the bottle, but I do believe we can manage the dangers of the genie in a much better way than we can. We can establish a system of constraints and prohibitions with a strong verification regime where we would not be living on the precipice of catastrophe on a global scale. I worry about an individual weapon going off somewhere, but I have not stopped worrying about a much larger exchange between countries with an inadvertent or uh, accidental or intentional. Um, and just to your question about Ukraine, um, and I know Ukraine is held up as an example of why states should keep their nuclear weapons, but I think for me, um, I don't reach that conclusion for two reasons. First of all, I think it's a red herring. I think that that there was no possibility that Ukraine would ever have been allowed to maintain its nuclear arsenal that this Russian state would never have agreed to leave its weapons there. So I think that's a bit of a mythology. And secondly, um, notwithstanding many states with nuclear weapons, it hasn't prevented um, these types of incursions around the world. So I think that we 
utility of nuclear weapons is, is actually quite limited. I think it, uh, they have, we can say, safely succeeded in deterring state-on-state -state nuclear use up to this point, and for that, you know, we've been lucky. Uh, it may not continue, uh, but it certainly has not deterred uh, a lot of conventional incursions and wars around the world. My question is on the complexity of this state in nuclear development. Last week, a certain brigadier from the Pakistan study plan uh, commented that uh, they had weeded out certain elements who had uh, you know, not passed their uh, basic checks in one of their, uh, during their routine and periodic checks. The point that these people are handpicked from the Pakistan army to guard the nuclear assets and uh, would have been subjected to checks in the initial state. And now they fail checks in uh, midway. It indicates an element of indoctrination at, uh, between them even at a later stage. Uh, with the US being one of the likely targets in case a nuclear weapon is taken out by the non state actors, what do you see, uh, or what kind of safeguard do you see at diplomatic and political level? which the, uh, the viewers should have to take care of any such eventuality. So I'm not sure when you say what kind of safeguard at the diplomatic and political level, but let me respond and then if I haven't uh, answered, you can elaborate further. Um, the state that I worry about the most with respect to imperialism is Pakistan. Pakistan has an advanced system. We are well aware not only of um, the active proliferation of uh, their program to other states, but also the strength of the uh, extremist movement within Pakistan. So you have a recipe for uh, a significant problem. I showed you earlier that one slide with the uh, three Al-Qaeda members who had been instrumental in leading the Al-Qaeda program to acquire a nuclear weapon. I did not show the picture of the two Pakistani weapon scientists who were working with them in Afghanistan. And they came out of the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission. And they were in senior levels and had very sensitive jobs. And so I think uh, it's very real concern that you put your finger on. And notwithstanding that they have personnel and liability programs to try and weed people out and have people who are vetted and uh, responsible managing their nuclear program, I think to the extent we can develop safeguards, I mean, you know, we, I know the U.S. has been trying very hard working with the government of Pakistan to sensitize them to the threat to get them to take action where concerns have been identified, to put a very stringent system in place for securing nuclear materials, and you know, we just have to hope that that works, but we'll have to stay on it. I think long term, it's a much more fundamental set of problems and issues related to governance in Pakistan that are going to need to be addressed if we want to succeed long term. I don't know. Did that, did that address the <coughs> In relation to this particular question only, I think the statement is probably attributed to great money. Who uh, continues to be with us, Pakistan's special plan that is getting I met in Hafti, I had a few months ago, and had a quote in the text of the Islam Sister Act. He continues to be employed as part of the statute of Pakistan. I think is that uh, the responsibility now focuses more on the personal security and the physical security of the nuclear cabinet. Now, so far, he won't specify it in a greater detail uh, than that. And then in that context, the global concern on Pakistan's personal security remains extremely high. Uh, as you know, Vikita Sirul Khatsa has been has mentioned about the steps they have taken in his book on nuclear weapons. 
They could also do research that like this, and of course, uh, 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 it, uh, it dismisses them as a possible threat in any significant way. But given the background and given everything else, the fact remains that this, remain, this will remain a very critical concern in India and the world for a very long time to come. Almost in any scenario that one can think of uh, uh, nuclear terrorism, source of nuclear, family nuclear, nuclear weapons, anything of that nature, I think Pakistan must feature very high in everybody's calculation. And it is in that sense, of course, in one sense, this is precisely where the uh, Shilkan Chairman and many of us have paid difficulties in accepting that Pakistan, you know, sort of features to the high the security system in India. Uh, and at the same time, accepting the challenge that we need and we face. Uh, but well, of course, this is a global challenge. One cannot just identify and isolate only Pakistan. But there's no, no doubt in anybody's mind, I think, given the reality of Pakistan today, it's a still important challenge for all of us. Last round of questions. With respect to the previous question, I just I would like to know the what uh, what kind of element is involved in nuclear blackmail with the Pakistan. And the second question is recently the advisor to the National Command Authority Khalid Kidwai said Pakistan needs to develop a short-term tactical nuclear weapon in Washington two days back. So how do you think that such development of tactical tactical nuclear weapons? Will affect the region, or it is the failure of NTA, which what NTA is doing in last few years in the region. So let me start with the second question. I'm not sure I understand what your question about nuclear blackmail is, but let me tackle the tactical nuclear weapons question. Um, I think it's clear we're going to have an adverse. The development of uh, Pakistani tactical nuclear weapons is clearly going to have an adverse impact on the security of the region. It is a classic response. If you look at um, the relationship between the U.S. and Russia, the nuclear relationship, during um, the Cold War, the U.S. deployed nuclear weapons in Europe as a part of NATO's response to the conventional superiority of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. And we've seen that now reversed post-Cold War, where Russian conventional capabilities have declined, but Russians are now maintaining a much larger tactical nuclear weapons arsenal in response to perceived superiority the NATO conventional forces. And so these weapons are used as an equalizer. And it's interesting to see um, NATO military officers saying these tactical nuclear weapons have no military role. They shouldn't even be deployed in Europe any longer. There's kind of a kind of, I would say, a growing um, debate about the possibility of removing those weapons from Europe, because uh, they're viewed just as political weapons, again, not having any real military utility. So it's fascinating for me to see now the same dynamic playing out between India and Pakistan, where the Indian conventional forces are far superior to Pakistan, and so Pakistan is playing this type of nuclear weapon class as an equalizer. But it's uh, no question introducing danger and Just folks and friends that they are extremely well secured. Um, maybe you could repeat the blackmail question because I wasn't understanding what the question was. Did you say that not all nuclear sites are well secured against the terrorists or criminals? And further, you mentioned about the Pakistan and Al Qaeda later who so, are so working over there. And two Pakistani scientists went there. And I think America knows what is happening, and even the Pakistani knows what is happening. So is it a kind of nuclear blackmail Pakistan is playing there? Is there any such kind of element there? I would like to know because for the funding as well as the security purposes of nuclear sites in Pakistan. Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure I would call it nuclear blackmail. That's an interesting concept because I'm not, uh, I guess one could debate how deliberate or systematic or government driven the participation of the two scientists in the Al Qaeda effort was because um, if I were the government in Pakistan, I would be extremely worried about losing control of my nuclear forces and my nuclear expertise. I can't imagine they think that's in their interest. Madam um, Lady Uh though you did mention that this may not be the right forum to discuss it in detail regarding the same report. And where are the content? I think if I'm not wrong, I did it some time back. Of the 31 countries uh, which have been analyzed, I think China, Pakistan, and India are 23, 24, and 25. If, or something similar, they are just one of the head. Uh, I have a, uh, why I'm asking this question is because we, we won't have the privilege to hear you again. You mentioned the uh, 19 uh, indicators and 56 sub indicators to be done. But my query is whatever indicators you have identified, once you are analyzing it, is it based on actual text? Uh, is it based on what these specific countries claim what they have done regarding those. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, as we all understand, uh, a lot of it may, you may not have access to it. Uh, even what they claim, especially we see China and uh, Pakistan, you can't believe, it, uh, believe what they say. Or is it maybe there is a school of thought that has been reading about it. So maybe it's prodding India to open up a little bit more, to be more transparent. Great question. Um, so I will say just a little bit about the report and the indicators and, and how they were put together um, and the methodology of the report. We learned a lot about how indices are, are developed and um, indices are not a result of having people on the ground actually physically going into and examining facilities and practices, that would be a, an impossible task, both because these are protected facilities um, where outsiders are not allowed to go in and uh, conduct <coughs> investigations. And so um, when we chose these indicators, by the way, that's why they're called indicators. They're an indicator of how a state is doing, not a, uh, an assessment or a, you know, based on an inspection. Um, the indicators that we chose, they fall into five categories, and they're all our assessment is based strictly on publicly available information. And let me just read out the five categories to you, and then um, I'll continue with the question. But we looked at, um, the first indicator is quantities and sites. So we looked at how much material does the state have and how many sites or facilities is it distributed across. On the premise that the more material and the more sites you have, the higher the risk environment. Second category was security and control measures. So we looked at um, what kind of um, physical security and accounting measures are I should actually be asking Ambassador China as a participant on the panel to be brief in this, but um, uh, what kind of uh, security measures are in place? And here, what we looked at was um, regulations, so published regulations as an indicator of how states are performing uh, their security and control measures. Um, third category was global norms. Does the state adhere to um, treaties and voluntary mechanisms? Uh, there are a, a small uh, group of, of key treaties and voluntary mechanisms um, supporting uh, kind of a global, to the extent there is kind of a global system, uh, there are these things in place. The fourth category is domestic commitments and capabilities. So, a state may have regulations on the books, but does it have the does it have the legal architecture? Does it have the um, kind of internal system and uh, 
uh, training procedures in place to actually implement uh, the laws. And the fifth category is risk environment. Um, does this state have terrorist groups operating on its territory that have expressed an interest in acquiring materials? And do we think those terrorist groups actually have the capacity to potentially acquire those materials? So there are a number of indicators in each of these five baskets. And, and we um, work with the Economist Intelligence Unit who have uh, hundreds of people around the world who have collected data um, using open sources. Um, and we assembled that data. And we gave every state that was evaluated, each of the 25 states in the most recent index, an opportunity to provide comments on the data that we corrected. So 17 of the 25 governments um, gave us data corrections. And by the way, I should say, we never rely on just what a state says. We rely on um, published data, laws, regulations in effect. And if a state were to come to us and say, we need a correction to our data, we've got it wrong in the results, we don't just say, yeah, fine, yes, we'll correct it. We say, prove it. Show us, show us where this um, regulation exists or where this law exists. Um, so is this a perfect index? No, it is, again, it's uh, a set of indicators that are trying to come up with a rough picture of how states compare to one another when assessed against the same set of indicators. And I think there's a whole separate and rich dialogue that we could have about why the India score the way it did. Um, I myself was quite surprised when the results came back and I said, oh my god, this can't be right. <laughs> I mean, this is not a convenient conclusion at all. And um, we went through the whole team and each indicator we went and, you know, is this right? Where's the evidence? Is it wrong? Should it be changed? We scrubbed it very hard and um, the chip science is what they do in the end. And I, I really hope that uh, the Indian score increases in the next index. I don't like working for an organization that's not welcome <laughs> when we cross the border because this is an Result, but I, I do hope, and I think it has spurred uh, an internal debate and discussion within India that's been a very useful one. And I think um, hopefully we will see if the, the transparency question, uh, I'll just end on, on this word, uh, India does suffer from, I think India does a lot of things very well, but who would know it? Right? If you're not willing to talk about it, if you're not willing to share information about the systems you have in place, how does the world know? And we no longer live in the kind of world where it's good enough to say, just trust me on this. When my security depends on what you do, I can't just trust you, no matter how much I like you. So uh, hopefully we can see this dialogue moving to a new place where there is a little bit more transparency. And it's going to be an essential part of India's uh, sustainability of its nuclear enterprise over time. Thank you for your question. I just would like to, uh, the general has asked me if I'd like to make any closing comments, only to say thank you uh, all very much for your attention and uh, uh, for being present today. This is a wonderful opportunity for me, and I'm very grateful. So thank you. Well, uh, once again, uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, very patiently answering questions and completing the presentation and uh, for organizing this. I wanted to add a few points which uh, uh, would support her uh, uh, statement. Like, you know, uh, once we ask about the question of process or uh, learning, uh, in the international fora, if you go back 30 years, when Chernobyl happened, on nuclear safety also, there was very little concern, very scant concern. And uh, as she, she, she said, the history uh, past, uh, the people thought, oh, this is Soviet Union, they don't, they are collapsing. So the problem was Soviet Union, it's not ours. 
So in the IAEA and in the main part of the 80s and 90s, when they were trying to focus on safety, network security, uh, it was great reluctance. Now we can safeguard us. We, we, we can ensure safety of us. So the nation states who are running nuclear reactors, they are refusing to focus on that. Because the one, at that time on two incidents, the Three Mile Island in 79, and after that there was some efforts. And uh, generally, so they didn't bother. So it took consistent effort for nearly now 30 years to get them to focus on safety. And in spite of that, the Fukushima happened. And if you see the reports of Fukushima, the plant operators had mistakes. I had done, and TEPCO was found to be doing so many things wrong. So that experience of nuclear safety is a good pointer that, God forbid, because the accident in the case of nuclear security could be far more catastrophic, it could be worse. So that's the reason why nuclear security has to be seen in, in the, you know, this concern, with anxiety, with a little bit of focus. And it should not be confused with other issues. Because if you confuse them with other issues, then uh, there's a tendency that, uh, you know, like, uh, and then they, they come to India. You see, if you've been in India for the last uh, few days, the kind of TV uh, was talked yesterday in year four. What a matter, it was such a, you see, it was such a petty, petty matter that uh, uh, it's a standard drill. Uh, countries have embassies and embassies have national days, and national days they have not been. So whoever they like to invite you to go there. But in today in India, things are so extraordinarily sensitized that yesterday in Pakistan's day, away from Pakistan's national day, uh, the presence of the Indian National State, who had been doing so for all these years, suddenly was very pretty sure. And you have all kinds of uh, you know progress and the events development from the television and media writing. It's a totally, uh, really, uh, what we call normal out of more things. In India's case, it so happens that many a time, a small thing, because of democracy and the very obstreperous democracy, if you bring things into public domain, <laughs> people run away with that. And there are interested parties who exaggerate it and distort it. Uh, I'll give you another example from a case. 98, 97, uh, People have been difficult. They have come to some understanding of safeguards. The parliament also, okay, okay, safeguards, India will not accept. It is very difficult in the economic energy and I mean, that the safeguards are discriminated as far as it is. Then came the issue of one of the World Operator Association of Nuclear Operators and the Atomic Energy Department it was thinking of Vetica and OSAR safety mission from World Association of Nuclear Operators. And they thought it would be a good thing to bring in there. Some little knowing news commentator wrote it that India is accepting one of safeguards. Then the parliament they are not us. Yeah, you are accepting safeguards, how can you do this? And you know, you have people who are not, not very well versed. So, I have a very important then got very intrigued. And the Prime Minister told them, why are you doing this? So they say, okay, we will go home by me. So, be between reality and perception, there is such a gap in India. That when you ask for, uh, like you said, that if you are doing so, please show and, uh, and show regulations. The problem with, uh, with uh, our system is that if you begin to show details of how you are doing things, there are busy bodies who start debating and discussing it and distorting the question. So that's where we are, this is our problem. We, we really, uh, we have but the fine with the star business, like you find Mr. Kidway, who was the uh, Pakistan SDP head, you find him dancing a little bit all over the place. He goes to the York, he can't even know when he's talking to his story. So in Pakistan's case, they have, uh, they want to carry this, they want to count down their nuclear program and their nuclear weapons, to tell them what they do, pay attention to us, they are nuclear weapons powers. In the case of India, they can the whole tendency of the establishment is to talk as little as possible because as I, when we say that we were reluctant and friend, it is not just a main thing, but it is true. The people give to make those who are important don't believe that it is a good way. So that's the reason why in India there is a reticence. 
Now, if you come to later traditions, then uh, I don't know how to do I just wanted to, if that can give some explanation, uh, I wanted to sort of read on, on behalf of India. And my friend, he, he speaks of it, he knows so much about it. Because you uh, can find the difference. So I thought with those words, uh, uh, I'd like to get thank you and uh, profusely thank you to your work. Well, for me to thank Dr. and Dr. Trevor, it's a point and gracious to have come here and share their views and concerns with us. And of course, the range of questions that is answered and the depth of knowledge chase is great. This is us. We have many miles to cover before we look at these. 30 issues and implement. And one concern which of course needs to be looked at further is the dual use technology and the proliferation of technology which is allowing this material to arrive. And of course, she is had a concern about terrorism, so are ours. I mean, all of us keep talking of Pakistan, but there are many other states which would now produce missile material and we have greater concern. So I think the need is to block technology. And there is a need for an international convention wherein all states agree. And if the Sherpas do want to wish uh, to create this, we will be quite happy to join. Uh, we've been made aware. And of course, a uh, certain amount of guidance has come from USA and USSR and now, of course, Russia. Uh, we need to learn from that. And I'm sure our policy makers are aware of that and in fact further to develop better processes, better practices as you enunciate it. So at the end of it, it is for me to thank you once again for being kind to come here and if you would be kind enough to accept a small momentum from us.